What Cyrus did to Babylon is what Jesus will do to Babylon the Great. One is a type of the other. Everybody understands. I know some of you know this from our other teaching, but a lot of people didn't know it. All right, let's go back to Ezra. <clears throat> you have nothing in common with us. Oh, let us build with you. Once they cannot stop it by persecution, they try to infiltrate and sell a bill of goods. We're all one. We have the same God. Let's be united. Unfortunately, we no longer have too many leaders like Zerubbabel and Yeshua who says, no, we are not one. Does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin, or do you atone for your own in purgatory? The salvation come by an ex opere operato sacramental ritual, or does it come by second birth? Is there one mediator between God and man, Jesus the righteous, or is Mary the co-mediatrix? Is the vicar of Christ the Holy Spirit, or is it the Pope? No, you have nothing in common with us. Roman Catholicism is not scriptural. Eastern Orthodoxy is not scriptural. Liberal Protestantism is not scriptural. Oh, you're judgmental. No, I'm scriptural. You have a different gospel. You do things that the word of God says are abominations like necromancy, praying to the dead. His blood cleanses from all sin. You don't atone for your own in purgatory. I had a brother here yesterday talk to me. His church went into churches together in England, and there was people saying the Hail Mary with, with believers in the, in, the, in the churches together. This is what happened. This is, if they can't stop you by opposition, they will try to stop you by infiltration and seduce from within. It's an old strategy. There's always the dragon, the persecutor, and the serpent, the seducer. All Mormons believe in Jesus? Again, how many people name Robert Jones in the Cardiff Telephone Directory? How many people name John Williams in the Cardiff Telephone Directory? Does that mean they're the same? Mr. Williams or Mr. Jones? No, it does not. The Mormon Jesus is not our Jesus. Their Jesus is not the monogenes, the only begotten of the Father. It is the spirit brother of Satan, as we know. Our Jesus said, if anybody says I've returned, physically don't believe it. I'm coming the way I left. Every time there's a mass, the Roman Catholic Church says, Jesus has returned physically Eucharistically. The Eucharistic Jesus of Rome is not the Jesus of Scripture. The Isa of Islam, inferior to Muhammad and only a prophet, is not the Jesus of Scripture. The Michael the Archangel Jesus of Jehovah's Witnesses is not the same Jesus. Many will come in my name. Oh, we can be one. Let's work together. And they'll say we're going to pioneer some social cause. We have to morally redeem society by being together. It is a false unity. It is not the unity of the spirit. When Tobias can't stop you, he infiltrates. He plays the ecumenical unity card. I once had a woman from England speaking at a conference in, in America with her husband. They left the medical profession to run some kind of ministry, they think. And she said, but Jesus prayed we would be one. And I said, yeah, now read what he said first. Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. In the high priestly prayer, his prayer for unity was predicated on right doctrine. You cannot have the unity of the spirit on false doctrine. 
That's not the spirit. He's the spirit of truth, not the spirit of error. Again, we know these things, but most of the church does not. More frightening, there are many theocrats and denominational leaders who know these things, but are willing to compromise them for the sake of theocratic politics. I've warned many times, whenever you deal with any form of Gnosticism, you're going to have a problem. They're going to use biblical terms, but mean something different by the terms. Does anybody need me to explain this? Does anybody not know what I mean? Please be honest, it's important. Everybody knows what I mean? Who doesn't? You don't know what I mean. Okay. Thank you. This is what it means. When a Roman Catholic, when I witness to a New Age person, okay, you tell them I saw the light, they'll say they saw the light. Your light is Jesus, their light is the cosmic illumination of the inner self. You tell them you were born again, they were born again. They're thinking of reincarnation from Hinduism. You tell them you have the spirit, they have the spirit. But to them, it's not the Holy Spirit, it's the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. Okay? You tell them you believe in sin, they believe in sin. That's given place to negative energy. They'll use the same terms, but mean something different by the terms. Okay? Well, when you talk to a Roman Catholic, a Roman Catholic theologian, usually Jesuits, and a, and, a, and a Protestant, and they have an ecumenical theological dialogue. The Protestant will say, oh, we're saved by grace. And the Jesuit will say, oh, yes, we are saved by grace. Oh, the Reformation was a mistake. Let's shake hands and forget the whole thing. What they don't tell you is, in English, grace is undeserved favor. In Hebrew, it is chesed, God's covenant mercy, in Greek, it is charism, a gift. So to us, grace is a gift. It's unearned, it's undeserved, it's unmerited. It's just God's bestowed favor. To a Roman Catholic, grace is an ethereal substance earned by sacraments. You've got, active, you've got actual grace, sanctifying grace. They have different kinds of grace, but none of it is biblical grace. They can both agree they're saved by grace because they have two different definitions of grace. You understand? They can both agree we believe in Jesus, but they have two different Jesuses. <laughs> that is how seduction works. Does that make it clear? Okay. It's important everybody understands these things. Even if it's one or two people, it's important everybody understands these things. Uh, let's look. No, you have nothing in common with us. When they can't stop you, they will infiltrate you. They will try to ingratiate themselves to you, but it gets worse. Intermarriage became a main problem at this time. Let's look at Nehemiah 12, verses 44, 44 to 45. On that day, men were also appointed over the chamber for the stores, the contributions, the first fruits, the tithes to gather into them from the fields of the cities, the portions required by the Torah. For the priests and Levites for Judah rejoiced over the priests and Levites who served. For they performed the worship of their God and the service of purification together with the singers and the gatekeepers in accordance with the command of David and his son. God is doing something. They're restoring biblical worship in the temple. Something else is brewing at the same time. Whenever you see God working in a church, in a ministry, in a family, in a marriage, problems in the family, problems in the church, problems in the marriage, problems with the children, problems in the ministry, Whenever you see God working, the enemy is not going to take it sitting down. 
He's trying to hatch a plan. He tries to counter attack. Yes, enjoy the blessing, but be on your guard. Praise God for what he's doing. But until Jesus comes back, the enemy is not going to relent. When God is working, blessing, using, moving, the enemy is hatching a plan. Your church is growing, praise God. People are being saved, praise God. Your children are walking with the Lord, praise God. Thank God for all those things. But the enemy will not take it sitting down. Fast in the blessings and delights of the good things of the Lord by all means. But keep your eyes peeled. Let's go for that. Back to Nehemiah 6, 17 and 18. And in those days, letters went from the nobles of <coughs> Judah to Tobiah. And Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shekenia, the son of Arach, and his son Yehohanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berkaya. What a mess. Chapter 13, verse 28, even one of the sons of Yehoida, the priest, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. So I drove him away. One of the ways Satan is attacking churches is this. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. That is not only talking about salvation. Oh, I know his song is no good, but the kids like it. I know Bobby Houston is teaching sexually perverse things to teenage girls, but the kids like it. I know the Hillsong pastor in New York will not stand against homosexuality. He refuses to address it, but the kids like it. I know that church is no good, but my wife's friends all go to it. Is the husband the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church? Or is the wife the head? Big problems. When church politics become interspersed, intermingled with family and personal relationships. I can't defend this one because he's married to my cousin Felix and, you know, cousin Jasper is married to his sister. And when you get into marriage with non-believers, it gets worse. They will dilute truth to keep peace. Pay attention. One of the things that is happening in the church today, and I mean the evangelical church, one of the most serious and fundamental flaws that has opened the door for much other era, one of the most basic problems is that truth has become not doctrinal, but relational. Truth is no longer to many Christians doctrinal, but relational. If it was based on our relationship with the Lord, it would be doctrinal. But it is based on our relationship with other people. Therefore, doctrine is sacrificed. You understand? Truth becomes relational instead of doctrinal. Once that happens, the horizontal relationships we have with each other have supplanted the vertical relationship we have with God. 
that is absolutely foundational to what is wrong with most of the church today. trying to keep an artificial unity, an artificial peace, trying to placate relationships at the expense of truth. Once they do that, they're doing it at the expense of the Lord. Remember, Jesus didn't say, I know the truth. He said, I am the truth. People become put in place of God. Truth becomes relational instead of doctrinal. Nobody wants to offend anybody. Well, let's look at this. They're all interrelated. There is a movement of churches in South Africa that used to be very good. But some of the leaders went into a Christological apostasy, saying that the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Jesus are two different spirits. Now that, fun that is a fundamentally wrong Christology and a wrong pneumatology. It's a wrong doctrine of the Trinity or triunity of the Godhead. But because so many people from families were in it, and they had intermarried with other people within the church, it was allowed to continue. And now that movement is declining. Churches are breaking away from it. People are leaving it. In the short term, you might think you can keep the peace. The only real way to keep the peace is the Prince of Peace. No Christ, no peace. No truth, no Christ. No Christ, no peace. No truth, no Christ. Let's continue. Chapter 13, the eviction of Tobiah. Things are restored. Worship is restored. The Levites are worshiping the Lord. They have a wonderful choir. The oil and wine is being brought into the temple storehouses. The Shekinah is returning after the Babylonian captivity. God is doing something wonderful in our midst. Praise the Lord. Chapter 13, verse 1. On that day they read aloud from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And there was found in it that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. This is not speaking about race. Ruth was a Moabitess, but she converted to the worship of the true God. Your God shall be my God, your people my people. It is not about race or ethnicity. It is about faith. If a Moabite came to worship the true God, if a Muslim becomes a believer in Jesus, and I'll tell you what, most of the best believers, the most Christ-like people I've ever met in my life, or people say that of Islam. You'd be very hard pressed to find a more consecrated believer than somebody saved out of Islam. Truly saved. Remember when Jacob saw the face of God and his brother Esau? <laughs> That's what happens when you look at somebody saved out of Islam. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Not about race. No Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God because they did not meet the sons of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So it came about when they heard the law, the Torah, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. I've said this many times. 
I'll say it once again, even though it's going to annoy you. Ancient enemies remain ancient enemies. No matter what they say in their interfaith dialogue of the 57 Muslim countries in the world, not one will give Christians and Jews the rights they get in the Western world. Islam will always be the enemy of Christianity. Roman Catholicism will always be the enemy of the true gospel. You hear what I said? Roman Catholicism will always be the enemy. Oh, Pope Francis has a good name. So does Tobiah. Pope Francis, who says if two men are living together in a homosexual relationship, who is he to judge? God is already judged. Let's slow down. Ancient enemies. Talmudic Judaism. Talmudic Judaism is not real Judaism. It is rabbinism. It's not Judaism. It is rabbinism. Rabbinism will always be the enemy of Messianic Judaism, of Jewish believers. It doesn't matter if you wear a keeper. It doesn't matter if you speak to them in Hebrew. Once you bring Yeshua into the equation, you are factored out. Rabbinism will always be the enemy of true Judaism. That is the Torah fulfilled in Yeshua. That's the way it is. Verse 4, Nehemiah 13. Now prior to this, Eliashib the priest, my father shall return, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, being related to Tobiah. Oh my good Lord. It all becomes relational and theocratic. Even though they just read the Torah, it is all relational now and theocratic. Leading clergy sell out the way J.I. Packer did. The way John Kent from the Church of the Nazarene did. The way anybody who signed evangelicals and Catholics together did. The way Chuck Colson did. The way they all did. Verse 5. Tobiah had prepared a large room for him where formerly they put the grain offerings, the frankincense, the utensils, the tithes of grain, wine, and oil prescribed for the Levites and singers and the gatekeepers and contributions for the priests. Once you bring Pope Francis in, or anybody like him, once you bring Tobias in, Real worship goes out the window. It becomes something very different. Instead of amazing grace, it's Ave Maria. Gee, it's good to see you. <laughs> like Tom Lear. First you climb down on your knees, fiddle with your rosaries. Bow your head with great respect and genuflect, genuflect, genuflect. You can do what steps you want to if you have cleared them with the pontiff. Everybody take it on, Kyrie eleison, doing the Vatican rag. <laughs> Walk into that long processional, there that cat has got religion. Tell you if your sin's original. If it's not, try playing it safer. Drink the wine and chew the wafer. Two, four, six, eight. Time to transubstantiate. 
So climb down upon your knees and fiddle with your rosaries. Bow your head with great respect and genuflect, genuflect, genuflect. Make a cross on your abdomen when in Rome, do like a Roman. Ave Maria, she it's good to see you. We're doing the Vatican right. Unbelievable. How many here are saved out of Roman Catholicism? Yes. Aren't you glad? <laughs> On the day of judgment, the first one who's going to denounce the Church of Rome is going to be Peter and Mary. The grain offerings and the frankincense. We know what grain offerings are a picture of from Leviticus 2. And we know what frankincense is, the prayer of the saints. Now, you know what the prayer of the saints sounds like? It's when the Holy Spirit intercedes with our spirit and we talk to the Lord. That's the prayer of the saints. There's another kind of prayer. It goes like this. Misere tui omnipotens deus et dimisis peccatis tuis peducate et vicem etena. Confitio de omnipotente, beate Maria semper virgine, beate Michele Arcangelo, beate Juan e Baptiste, Santos Apostolos, Pedro Polo, Omni TV, Cogitazione Verbo Opere, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, idio precor, beate Maria semper virgine, I confess to Mary, to Michael the Angel. That's what they say. Let us pray, brethren, oratre fratres. So she be at Dominus sacrificium de manibus tui, at laudum et gloriam nobilis sui, ad utilitatem coque nostrum, totius que ecclesiae sui sante. Amen. You got the cash, they got the absolution. The real incense goes out the window. Real worship is gone. What else goes out the window? The utensils. What you need to bring the acceptable sacrifice. What else goes out the window? The wine and the oil, the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Spirit, and the new wine, out, prayers of the saints, out, the pure grain, out, and then the clergy get corrupted. Why did you do that for? You threw out real prayer. You threw out real worship. You threw out real doctrine and corrupted the clergy. Why'd you do that for? Unity. <laughs> you understand? Verse six. But during all this time, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I'd gone to the king after some time. However, I asked leave from the king, and I came to Jerusalem. And I learned about the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah. It is evil! When you accommodate false religion, Chrislam is evil. It's evil. Talk the people saved out of Islam. 
They took my friend who I went to seminary with, Dr. Rahmatula Khan. He went back to Pakistan. They hacked him to death with machetes. They cut off his arms, they cut off his legs, and they cut off his head. He was my friend. I used to practice Arabic speaking to him. He had a doctorate in Islam from El Azra University in Cairo. He was a dear friend and brother. And they hacked him to death. Chrislam. The evil they had done. The evil. And they did it for Tobiah. By preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. He tried to stop that house from being built. Once it was built anyway, he moved in. It was very displeasing to me. So I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. Get your novenas out of here. Get your chrislam out of here. That guy, T.B. Joshua in Nigeria, he had verses of the Koran written on the wall of his church. Then I gave an, did you see when his building collapsed? <laughs> then I gave an order and they cleansed the rooms. And I returned there the utensils of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. We want the grain, we need the oil, we want the proper sacrifice, we want the real incense, the prayers of the saints in Revelation and Ezekiel. But you're not going to have any of that stuff when Tobiah is living in the temple. He must be evicted. But notice the evil was not primarily attributed to Tobiah. Tobiah was just being Tobiah. He was always nefarious. He was always sinister. He always had an agenda. He was just being slick according to this world's wisdom. He was a good sneak. He came in the character of the serpent. When the dragon couldn't stop the work, Satan sent the serpent. That's just Tobiah being Tobiah. The evil was done by Eli Ashiv. It becomes our own leaders who bring these people in. How, J.I. Packer, if you're watching, this is going on TV. You signed evangelicals and Catholics together, and you call yourself an evangelical theologian? You, Norman Geisler, you're a Thomist. You follow the influences of Thomas Aquinas, and you teach that Roman Catholicism is not a false church with truth in it. It's a true church with some error. Your name is not Norman. And your name is not J.I. Your name is Eli Ashiv. Remember, the way forward is the way out. There's going to be a restoration, a revival, a real semblance of what God has ordained in his word. Truth must be doctrinal, not relational. Our relationship with God has to come before our relationship with other people, including family. Eli Yashiv must be confronted. And Tobiah, 
and his wares must be evicted. Throw him out. In the name of Jesus, God bless.